So let me start with the quote. Um, can you see? Can you see my presentation? Can I see a thumbs up? Okay. If you don't stand up for children, then we don't stand for much. As I mentioned from before, um, our children is the next generation. I mean, not to mean that we're going to depend on them, but these are the children that will be making the laws um, going through about the city when we are already old and gray and we can't do anything much about the community anymore. We will rely on these children when they are adults already. Their decisions will also affect our our um quality of life so as the adults right now we should um already advocate for them and stand up for what we think are healthy for these children for you know what will make them um well-rounded human beings in the future so this is our agenda today so we're going to talk about effective advocacy because of course we can be very passionate about one singular issue but if we don't know how to um, properly advocate for it then we won't be able to send the perfect um, message we won't be able to um, fact check you know we, before we advocate for something we have to know we have to know that everything that we know is true 100% because we can't be going around advocating for false information, right? So there is such a thing as effective advocacy. Then we're going to talk about um, sharing goals with the people around us. That is how do you connect with the people around you and how do you spread your advocacy in such a way that it will spark a fire? It will actually bring about change. How do you you know, share these goals within the community and even more outside if you could. Then after that, um, we would talk about how to teach children advocating themselves because we know that children should also have agency in asking for what they need and for what they want. We should be um, trusting um, our children in saying what they need. If they say, teacher, I need more time. Teacher, I need a different a different way because I don't understand. They should be able to um, know how to say these things without coming off as rude, you know, having the proper words. We have to let our children know which kind of words to use, how to um, describe to other adults so that they can be understood as well. And then we're going to um, summarize it all by um, presenting an action idea. So there will be a scenarios on the screen and we can get to share how we're going to advocate for those issues for our um for whoever we, they're intended for so if you're advocating it to the administrator of your school how will you how will you write a letter for that if you're advocating it for the lawmakers in your community how are you going to phrase that out as well and at the end, I'm also going to show you how to lay out a letter if you're going to send it to a legislator, how to properly word out yourself so that you get attention, you have your resources, you make, um, you really spark that change. So how do you make a letter that um, catches a legislator's attention? Because of course, it won't really make any um, impact if it doesn't catch the attention of the legislator because there's so many letters coming in I'm sure from the community and maybe they just browse through it right so there should be something that gets their attention so later we'll tap more into that so let's start with um, the five steps to effective advocacy so number one is of course know your facts because just as I said, um, you can't be advocating for something that you're not really 100% sure about. Know all the different aspects and all the different faces of the singular issue that you want to tackle. So for example, if you want to um, talk about, for example, children's hours in the classroom. For example, they take, I mean, for, just for example, your school takes 12, whole 12 hours for children inside the room then you feel like this 12 hours might not be very hmm, very efficient for children because imagine children spending 12 hours at school but you know this is actually a thing because here in Singapore schools are open from 7 a.m to 7 p.m so it might not be from our culture it might be 
for yours too, because a, a, a school could also be a child care institution. So it could be a place where, you know, parents leave their children and then come back for when they're done with work. So that's what happens in Singapore. And if you want, for example, if that is also what's happening in, in your country and you feel like it's not culturally, culturally appropriate, then you might want to um, look out. So what are your facts? Um, what are the laws that touch up into this, um, into this issue? So are there laws protecting that children should be in school from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m.? Or are there not? Do you have any other um, institutions that also advocate, advocate for this um, issue? So you should learn these different aspects just so you know your facts before you start um, telling people, telling other people about your advocacy. Um, second is you should listen to your children. So with that example given, maybe your children might, maybe they won't be able to say, I don't want to be in school for 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Because, you know, usually children don't have a concept of time. Maybe they would say around 4 p.m. They would say, oh, I'm tired already. I want to go home. Or, you know, the, the usual whining. Children would whine. And personally, I believe it's not whining. I don't feel like children need attention in a negative way. I feel like if children need attention, it's because they deserve to get attention. They deserve to be listened to. So if your children are starting to whine already, maybe there's a need that isn't met. Maybe there is um, a different sort of um, way that you should be doing certain things. Maybe they need to take a nap. Maybe they're hungry. Maybe they need play. Maybe they need multisensorial um, things can they reach the end of 7 p.m now it's up to you as an educator if you're gonna let them okay whatever you're you're, you're here i'm tired already you can go whatever go play it's at, at this station or you can also listen to them and maybe talk to their parents hey your your child has been you know talking about this certain thing maybe may i know what is the um what is the setting at home would there be a possibility that your child stay at this certain hour and then come back at this hour? Or do they really have to spend the whole day at school? See, so you should listen to your children. And the next part is engaging with the community. So now we have social media already. It's very easy to just post the status, just to tweet about it, post a caption, or even just put a hashtag. And you know, it it circulates the engagement around that topic and it makes the algorithm know that you're interested in these kind of topics, letting you connect to like-minded people or maybe even just as a source of research and connecting with different people. So if you start, for example, I don't know, have you noticed that when you browse through your media and you finish for example a five minute video talking about a toddler um having a tantrum at home and then suddenly all the videos in your feed and your timeline is about children already so that's because the algorithm um, knows what kinds of content you are um, interested in so a way to engage and to collaborate with different people in the community before you actually actively advocate for something is to connect with different like-minded people so that you can also broaden your approach, you could also sharpen the way you think because you have these different perspectives, right? Um, a white perspective would be different from a Latino perspective, different from a Northern Asian perspective, from a South Asian perspective. They're all different. Um, and even in the city you're in, um, the East side might be different from the West. So you might be able to compare the different um, aspects and issues the children are having. And this might um, lead you to connecting with people that um, alike to what you think. So when you are able to connect with people, you have a stronger advocacy because you have a larger voice, if I'm putting the words correctly, a larger voice um, and a community that you can lean on to, someone who can help you fact check, someone who can help you write down the words, who can look at your letter for you and say, hey, this is too rude. 
because as the fourth um, point is building relationships. You won't be able to build stronger relationships if you don't connect with people in a way that's polite, in a way that you're proactively ad advocating for something. Because, you know, sometimes it can be a little, it can feel a little hmm, burnt out, burning out when you feel like nobody's listening to you. Everything is such a mess. Um, all these legislators are definitely not educators and are just making the laws for make, 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 make. And you might want to start to demand things. You might want to start to ask for something in a very aggressive way because you are time pressured. These children are not stopping from growing. Every day of their life is passing through. And if nothing happens, well, they will grow up in a society that is what you have like now so you might feel pressured to demand 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 but it really is more important to build relationships to connect with people so that they get to understand they get to listen and are more open-minded to listen to you when you are um, talking to them in a very respectful and calm manner and lastly let's not give up um give up in advocating for our children so I just want to ask um, everybody here, is there a time where when you were so stressed and so time pressured about um, what's happening in your class or maybe in your children's community? You may type it in the chat or you may, um, you may raise your hand if you want to talk. So while um, we we're waiting for people. If you want to share your experiences, I'll share to you mine. So before I worked in a in a Rego inspired um, school in the Philippines. If you don't know what Rego inspired is, it's um it's a philosophy built in Italy, in the Reggio part of Italy, and they built this um during the war. So the whole concept is um letting children explore things in nature so it's almost like waldorf but a little different because waldorf is centered in the art centric um way of um introducing concepts and making children enjoy um their learning well rego is something like that but making it a little more purposeful with the way of life so for example a child can they, they teach child how to cook already how to create things using the things from their bin their trash bin you know it's a very um eco-friendly um no purchasing anything recycling reusing kind of way okay so i was in this institution right and then they did not have a curriculum for literacy. So they just said, these children will learn to read if you read to them every day. Well, that might, you know, it sounds logical, really, because like if you run 10 miles a day, then in two months, you can run 20 miles like that, right, for adults. But reading isn't like that. There's a science of reading. There's a literacy for reading. So I had to um, talk to our directress. I told her directress, um, Miss, I think even if we are a, we don't have a structure, even if we um, do this resume Emilia approach, I still feel there should be a structure for learning English, mm -hmm. learning um, literacy, knowing, um, how to do how to teach the sounds how to teach how to write we can't just make them copy what's on the board and say hey they spelled that because it's not really the how to write right and you know what she said she said um it's different how to um how to teach because i came from a very traditional um approaching community and that my artistic skills are uh are very useful for this approach, but they don't. They did not trust me that much to handle or to um request for um a literacy um curriculum. So I said, okay, let me um let me gather um a few resources and can you please let me um have my own club so I can you know just show you how the process might work and if it works for you. 
And if you feel like it, it's okay, then can we please do it for the whole school? And so the director said, okay, you may have your own club. So let's see how many sign-ups you'll have. Of course, the, the parents, they were, they were happy to have a reading program. And so we started with just eight members. And at the end of the year, <laughs> there were already 52 members of the reading club. And right now, um, most of my students, um, the mom's students, um, contact me. They say, my, my child um, transferred to a traditional setting. And although they did not have um, a traditional way of schooling during their preschool um, years, during their formative years, their love of reading and the technique that you taught them um, are able to make them the top notcher in their class. So even the parents were bewildered. So after the results came, then I was able to connect with my fellow teachers, with the other um, facilitators in the school, and then we were able to convince our directress to actually um, consult a curriculum specialist, and they now have a literacy program in the school. So, well, I no longer work there, but it's fun to have that kind of impact to a community, even if you're not going to stay there for long, because come on, let's not be biased, right? We're here to help all children, even if we don't really, we don't really match how the ideals or how um, the curriculum works. So I, I moved on to another institution where it was a little more conservative, but still a little bit um, touching into the arts, so a little bit progressive, but more on the conservative side, because I feel like that's my belief as an educator. So, but I still was able to advocate for the children there. I did not leave that institution without making sure that these children get their right learning how to read properly, right? Because you, there you go. So for example, if you want to do that with your community as well, you just follow these five steps so that you have effective um, advocacy for your children. All right, so what is the goal for for advocacy, why 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 are we doing this? Why why do we have to um advocate for for our child? Um, first um we the goal is to understand the child's rights and as I said the rules of the system you're advocating in because of course we all live in different um places and there might be different um rules or different laws that govern um our schools and knowing and knowing this will help us know what might be best or what might be the best way to advocate for a child. And then, as I said a while ago, you should be calm and respectful in presenting a solution because if you keep on complaining and complaining, then the authorities might say, then what? Because sometimes they're also busy in the middle of doing other legislative matters, ad administrative matters, and they might also need a push knowing um, what the solution might be. There you go. So here's some thoughts to ponder. So being an advocate is promoting and defending another person's rights, needs, and interests. And for now, it is the child that we are interested in. Children might need an advocate if they are at risk of harm, aren't having their needs met, or are being denied rights. Being an advocate involves understanding issues, thinking about children, children's needs, and presenting solution. Helping children to learn to speak for themselves by building their confidence and encouraging to practice. So these are some thoughts to ponder. You can take a screenshot um, if you want to. So being an advocate, it means promoting and defending our children. It doesn't mean speaking for our children because ch children often find it hard to speak up for themselves. So they need someone else to speak for them. So this is some, we will be someone, an educator who speaks up for others, not just someone who just follows rules and you know, this is just a day job. It, you know, it's not going to impact anyone. We're just doing whatever is asked for. We still have to rethink and reevaluate what we're doing with our children, how we're doing it, and 
if you think your child's needs aren't met or are being denied their rights, you might need to step up and advocate for them because as educators, we know our children better than anyone else. They spend a lot of their active hours in school. And if people are making decisions that affect our child, for example, the roads, the housings that they live in, maybe, for example, in Singapore, they live, live in HDBs, for example. So these are buildings that are like condos. And we have to help make sure that these decisions made in the community are made in our child's best interests. All right, so here you go. Here's a little, a little discussion. So you can, you can raise your hand or you can, um, you can say it in the chat box. So here are two scenarios that you might want to start um, crafting a letter for. Do you want to screenshot this first and then we'll come back to it once I show you how to. Um... Taj, Taj, there is a, a question from Rhoda. Oh. It, it says, how, how to motivate children to listen to the adults? Motivate children to listen to the adults. What yeah. age are your children? Because I feel like there are different levels in um, convincing our children how to listen depending on their age bracket. Because if they're, for example one to three, it will be different to talking to a three to five or to five to seven. Rhoda, you can go ahead and activate your microphone and ask your question. Hi. Hello. Yes. Hi, Tachi. I'm Rhoda from Mozambique. Okay. And I have two uh, little boys. Mm -hmm. uh, they're my grandkids. And... Um, the little one is uh, almost four years. You will uh, turn uh, four years in August. Mm -hmm. And the, the elder one is seven years old. Mm -hmm. I found um, um, some constraints or maybe some challenge mm -hmm. on um, teaching the elder one uh, writing. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like to write. He can read. He read. Uh, very well from uh, his age, but he doesn't like to, to, to write. So I faced that challenge and smaller one, he liked to draw and he asked me to, to teach him to write some, the first letters uh, such as A, B, but the, the seven years old one, I'm really facing a difficult. He doesn't like to write. So how can I motivate him? Uh, to do his class at, uh, at home and to, to read and write more and more. Thank you. All right, so this is a seven-year-old that needs to practice more writing. Um, I feel like for that kind of age bracket, you have to show them how useful it is, how to know how to write. For example, you let them ask for what they want from the grocery by letting them write it themselves. For example, hey, um, I'm going to the grocery in a bit. Um, do you want anything? Um, but I can't listen to you now because I have to go wash the dishes first. Can you write what you want? And then I'll just get it when I go out and then I'll buy it for you, okay? I'll come back in 10 minutes. You go write what you want. I'll just go wash the dishes. With you. Go run, 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 run. And then maybe, maybe he, he might get stressed, right? He would say, but I don't know. I don't know how to write this. I don't know the sounds of the letters. I don't know the spelling of this. Well, then it could be a teaching moment. Well, do, do you want to know how? Do you want to know how to sound it out? And then once they start sounding it out, it doesn't really have to be correct. I feel like they should have the confidence themselves first to actually sound things out because some of the spellings in the English language could be a little bit um, hard to, to, to write and to navigate. Even as adults, we even have misspellings in our works. So it's more important for them to get their idea out, for them to be confident that they can write 
what they want to ask for. Another example would be not the grocery. What if, um, for example, your child wants to greet or wants to be in touch with their friends, but their friend doesn't have a phone yet? Because we all have different settings at home, right? Some some children are allowed um, children's messenger. I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> children's messenger or... Um, they have chat boxes for themselves. Some children, they're really not allowed. And the only way is to call their parents. Well, you can tell them, you can actually write your friend a letter. Or even just, you know, making it very functional for your home. Maybe you can let them um, label, since they have a younger sibling, right? If I, if I heard it correctly, they had a four-year-old um, sibling. Then it could be, if that's the case, then it could be a very, um, very good, very good tandem. The seven-year-old could write something and he could feel confident that, hey, little sibling, this is how you write share. And then he would feel very, very proud about what he did because he can teach someone. He can influence someone. Then this could be the start of how they would want to write. And writing legibly is even a different, um, different topic. Because, for example, he writes um, the list of groceries that he wants, but it's not legible. Then you might want to read it out loud for him. Then he might say, but, but that's bottle or that's, ju that's watermelon juice. And then you, you can read it as it is. It could be like bula mala like that. And then you would say, what's that? Why, why did you spell it like that? Maybe it could be the accent, but whoa, 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 right? And then you can tell him that's the importance of um, spelling and enunciation. So that's how you motivate someone to, to, well, to start writing and to practice writing. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> that was very helpful. Thank you very much for sharing the experience. All right. Thank, Thank you. All right. On another note, how do we get kids to listen? Because this is also um, a part for advocating for them. Because if they don't know, if they're you know not emotionally prepared, how to ask for what they need, then they won't be able to say what they need. <laughs> so how do we get them to listen to us so that we can teach them how to advocate from this for themselves? First, we get on to their level. We understand what or how they perceive the world. When you need your child's attention, you make sure that you get her attention by relating, really relating yourself to your child, knowing what matters most to them, using this as your leverage, um, getting down to their eye contact, making them feel that you understand where them where they're coming from, that you have been there before, and you would want to connect with them with a deeper level. It's number one. Number two, don't give them options if there's no option. For example, you're going to ask them, do you want me to show this to you? But it, it's a no. It's, for example, um, hmm, a tangible example. For example, using a knife for the first time. You cannot say, do you want me to show it to you first what if they say no then you're not respecting their decision then the only thing they'll be thinking of during the process is she doesn't listen to me he doesn't listen to me i'm so angry already he won't let me touch the the knife so don't give them questions that you know the answer should be yes don't give them an option if there's no option if it's writing time, you just say, hey, it's writing time. If you're angry, okay, you can be angry. I know it's frustrating, but that's the reason why we're practicing. So you get down on their level, but do away with don't. Do, do away with questions that, that don't have a no answer. You just give them a statement, acknowledge their feeling, move on. If they don't, if they're not yet ready, move on. Okay, and then... You shorten your speech, shorten your, your instruction. Ask them if they understand. You say thank you once they acknowledge. And then you ensure comprehension by letting them demonstrate to you what you just taught to them. And then you, you tell them what you observed. Okay, so for example, for the slicing knife, you tell them, I will show you first how to use this knife. Show, 
Okay, now it's your turn to do it. See, very short. Do. Thank you for letting me show it to you. That was a great job. That's making an observation. You cut that strawberry really well. It's very goodly sliced. You understand how to use a knife now? Going up, sliding down with one hand away. Other hand on the handle, one hand away. Up, going down. Up, going down. Understood? then you might want to ask them to repeat the instruction. And see, it's not really a long discussion, right? You made them listen. You made them follow. But you also made them learn the, the wonderfulness of listening. And when they listen, they can get to ask you, hey, how, how do I cut carrots in a different way, for example? Or how do I cut um, cabbage thinner, for example? Or how do you cut like... They can describe it like that, right? So there. So that's how you <laughs> get kids to. So oh, I see some chats. Let me see. Um, mm -hmm. It is somehow very easy to solve a single child that's having a problem in the class than to solve an issue that concerns the whole class as a teacher. I feel like it's a very different thing. I think both things are very difficult because a class could be very diverse, could have a different set of families, different set of places that they live in. Um, they could have different perspectives, but also a singular child also has a lot of connections with them. You're dealing with the family, dealing with their friends, dealing with their community, with how diverse a child is very diverse. They have race, they have religion, they have sexuality, they have orientation. So you have to deal with that also. I think it's both very difficult in a way, but when you are um, advocating for a whole class, I feel like as mentioned a while ago, it is better to have relationships already um, that are like-minded people with whatever you're trying to solve so that you have more clarity in what you want to do and in what you want to advocate for. Okay, Adamola Adam said, how to help a six-year-old child that often say she doesn't like her teacher as a result feels bad going to school. All right. That's understandable. You cannot like someone, but it doesn't mean you have to be rude to that person, right? So th this is something that we have to process our child in that, you know, sometimes I don't like this other person too. It could be a person that they're familiar with and they would be like, huh? But you're very friendly with them, mom. You're very friendly. Why? You hug them and you kiss them when we see each other on the street. And then you can say, not liking someone doesn't mean you have to be hurtful to them. You can still be respectful so that they can know your boundaries. They can understand where you're coming from. So you can, how do you explain that to a six-year-old child? When your child is coming to school, you make sure you get that perspective first. You make sure they feel understood. And then that, that's when you start explaining that, you know, you don't have to be so... Um, so rude in this this issue itself you still can um enjoy learning there's still other aspects of school that aren't focused to the teacher you still have your friends you still have the community around it you still have your playground time your recess time your other subjects if your child has other subjects as a six-year-old you can um show them that oh you know you can tell me all about it when you come home then maybe I can talk to your teacher and maybe we can sort it out so it's not something that you should be close to you know telling them no because if you do it will only aggravate the situation and make them not want to go to school some more you know if you start reprimanding them that hey that's not so nice then they will feel like you don't understand them then in the future they might stop sharing these um things to you so I think it's more op it's more okay to have um an openness even with a child that's only six age of six all right Ebenezer Ad Adams is there a way to motivate children between the ages of 10 to 12 to study on their own after school especially during vacations or holidays this has many levels actually um why for example one question I'm so sorry um why would a child be studying during the vacations or holidays? I feel like they should be 
on vacation <laughs> or on holidays, there is a constant pressure for our children to do well in school. Um, being academically um, top-notching. And I feel like sometimes it can drive our children to be competitive in a healthy way. But if we do it, um, if we do it too much, it might have an impact in how they um view their academics when they go to tertiary school or secondary school. They might be doing well academically, but emotionally, they're not already or physically. You know how some teenagers start self-harming when they don't get um the grade that they want. It, it becomes a really toxic culture for children when we push them wrongly as in studying during vacation or holidays. But I feel like if there is, for example, a project that is set um, to be done during the vacation, I feel like it is better to um, tell them that a little every day goes a long way instead of doing it one whole Saturday. That will be very draining, cramming, and won't even result, might not even result to a project that they like, ultimately like. So maybe do do this studying or this project with your child maybe 30 minutes a day. 30 minutes a day. It could be 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening. Then that's an hour already, right? They could accomplish so much with focused work, focused 30-minute work in comparison to a two hours that goes on and off and not really focused, no um no structure and they might have their brains trickling to elsewhere because it's already vacation <laughs> right <laughs> okay how can we make a child to feel comfortable at home solving the assignment brought from school i feel like having a corner where they would specifically do their housework in really helps a lot for example the pandemic babies that were taught by me during online school, I really helped them set up their um, school space. So this is their school space when they are doing their schoolwork. When they're outside the school space, they are not required to do any schoolwork at all. In result, when, they're, when they are in the school space, they are focused, more curious. They are time pressure. They're time bound. You can say 20 minutes in the school, school phase, whatever you finish, that's it. Or you can be with them in the school space and actually do work yourself. It could be beside you in your office or, yeah, you can have them a mini office as well. Then maybe they could um, see you doing elongated periods, of course, healthy elongated periods by your work table and let them know that you are able to finish a task by staying focused and knowing your goals, having what you need already and doing it in short periods of time. Yeah, so I feel like that is the start of making a child comfortable in doing schoolwork, even at home. So what should be considered for one to be an efficient advocate in Africa? Because I'm seeing two different contexts being compared. Okay, um, Gertrude, would you want to share? Because I haven't been in Africa, so I don't really know um, what context you lived in. Because I've only lived in Asia, in Philippines, and here in Singapore. If you could um, elaborate, then maybe we can compare and um, talk about how, how to advocate. Because I know there might be some cultural um, boundaries that might be overstepped that I don't understand because I don't live from where you are, right? Um, I'm enjoying your, thank you. I'm enjoying your lesson send me presentation. I, I believe I sent the presentation already. I, you might want to ask for it from Dr. Lambert. <laughs> All right. Yes, Frank Fury, is this um related to the African context? Would you want to share? Yes. Yeah. 
Hello, yes. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Okay, so mine is a question. Uh, uh, of course, um, I have a teenager. I've uh, been staying with her, uh, but she doesn't like to go to school. So mm -hmm. there was this other day she came back home and said, no, they're teaching hard stuff. So two days later, and then she said, ah, no, I will not write the exams right here where I'm learning now. I'll go, I'll write somewhere. Uh, where I feel better. So it was difficult for her to go back to where she was before. And then she decided, and after two days later, and then she told me to say, I've stopped going to school. I don't want school anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Then I had to negotiate with her. We, we discussed but it seems she didn't even want to listen to me. So she left my home and then she started staying with uh, an older sister and then she's back uh, where she's staying with me right now. Uh, but still, we, she can't even listen to me if I say go back to school. So she's home now, right now. She's not going to school. She's not doing anything, but she's a 16. Uh, assisting her or girl. So how can we motivate that girl to go to get her back to school? Well, I, I feel as like as much as as much as the, uh, we need to understand their needs. All right, I understand. This is a 16 year old um, person already who is very passionate about um, what they feel they need. So the first thing we do is to help them see the bigger picture. Why do we go to school? What do we want to achieve from school? What do we want to achieve from life? Do we need school to do that? Do you think you need school to do that? If you don't feel you need school, then what's your plan? Because this is already 16 years old. So I feel like they might have um they might have their own ideas already. Then if they have an idea, well, you you dive into it. How are you going to do this? What resources do you need? Do you have these resources without school? Do you think you can um, you can have access to these resources? Do you feel like if you don't go to school, you can do this, that, this, that with the steps that you have in mind? Did you already have it written down? Are you sure you can make it? If you can, then maybe give them a gap year. Let them experience the world. Let them make mistakes. Because they're already old. I feel like we shouldn't be constricted to the timeline that we were taught before when we were in school. That But this age, for example, at 25, we should already be independent, be stable, have savings, be preparing to buy a house already. I think we shouldn't be constricting ourselves to that specific timeline. What we should be um, advocating for our children is to make sure that they know what they want, that they're passionate enough to actually find solutions and actually helping them in, in doing that. And some children, most of the people actually need school to do that. The schools have educators that know what they're doing, know how to help you, know which resources to give to you so that you can reach your goal. But if you feel like you don't need to go to school, if you feel like you have connections, if you're very well connected even outside of the community, if you feel like somebody can give you resources, for example, your child, your 60-year-old child is very talented in coding already, for example, then give them a year. A lot can happen in a year. They might experience failure. There, they, there might be success. But we won't shame them for this. We won't um, reward them too much for this. It's just reality. Then after that year, maybe then you ask them, do you feel like you can do this? Because after this one year, it can change your life if you don't go back to school. It can be a whole different future for you if you don't go back to school. Are you sure you can do this? Because this is going to have consequence in the future. Life is not just now, you tell them. Life is not just now. Maybe you could be complaining right now. Maybe you feel like everything is against you right now. But there is also the future. What would the 30-year-old you want? Would it still want the freedom you have now? Because freedom is not really 
ultimate freedom is not really having everything and anything, you know, just free flowing. I feel like it, you make them appreciate the rules. You give them examples. For example, a man can just go inside an institution and get a chair that they like and bring it home. Does that mean they're free? Are they free to do that? Of course, they're free to do that. But will they be free if they do that? They will not. They will feel, they might feel guilt. They're, they might be hiding. You know, these are consequences that will happen in the future. So for a 16-year-old, I feel like they can already take into that perspective. You can tell them, when you were 10 years old, did you think that you would be the 16-year-old you are now? Of course, you talk to them about this when they are calm and ready to, to talk. Because if they're still feeling a little bit aggressive, a little bit angsty, they might not be as open to discussing these kinds of um, topics with you. And then once, um, for example, that whole year passed already and then you got down to this process, I feel like we should already trust them because they're 17 by them. Trust them but also support them because anyone could go back to school anytime they want. Anyone can go back and get a, a diploma of anything if they want. I feel like we really shouldn't be constricting ourselves to this imaginary timeline that was imposed to us by the adults before us. Right. I hope, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for uh, the <laughs> clarification. Yeah. Uh, at least, uh, yes, uh, even if I've, tried all that but still i'll keep on talking to her because uh i don't know if she's hungry or what uh, she always stay in the in her bedroom when i'm out for work or for something else she comes uh, at the living room and watch tv so when i'm back when it, she knows that i'm coming or i'm back she leaves the living room and goes where she wants to go so she comes uh, uh, when we have something to do but we don't even charge. So of course, sometimes she laugh, we laugh, we share stories, but not often. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I think many things, but many things. Well, thanks for the clarification. All right. Uh, good luck yeah. to you. Good luck to you. Yeah, so we, we can proceed on. And again, you can also send me this presentation if direct if possible. It, yes, it's yes. okay direct to my email or yeah sorry mm -hmm. i'm planning to, to to get the resources somehow the presentations are available on on the student platform you'll see live sessions as an option on the left side of your student platform and also uh, on the aiu youtube channel they're available i'll put a i'll put a link i'll put a message in chat for you to read taj are you ready for the next question from jose esono all right. Well, one last question, and then I'll proceed on how to get help. Because I feel like there are, are a lot of um, situations that make you feel like you've tried everything already, and it might not be up to you anymore. So then it's time for you to get some outside help. And how do you get some outside help? Because sometimes you against the world, it's just, it would feel too much. So I feel like that's why we advocate so that we get more like-minded people so that we ask and get help from the people that can actually help, can impose rules. It could be psychologists, could be psychiatrists, could be um, other educators, could be therapists, could be administrators, anybody who can help you in your advocacy. So I'll, I'll show you how to draft the letter for that on the next slide. But um, one last question. Yes, Herbert. Um, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Presenter. Uh, it is a touching uh, kind of uh, message which you have received. Thank you so much. So I wanted to add something to my brother Frank. I've been uh, kind of on an example, parents, if I have realized that children uh, below 16, sometimes they are very difficult, uh, especially in terms of showing them their future. 
But one thing I've realized is that when you are trying to, you know, uh, to make them progress in their acad academic, you personally, you have to know that they don't know what is coming, what you want them to be. But you keep on trying, keep on trying. Then after they cross that lever of not knowing the future, sometimes they come back. I have uh, witnessed many of them coming back saying, uncle, daddy, thank you, we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, but because of your pushing, because of your struggle, that's why we are where we are now. Uh, so uh, my brother Frank, um, you are pushing something which may be looking too difficult for you, but one thing you have to know is that um, these people are blinded in one way or another. So you have to know that you are their eyes and you have to keep on pushing, pushing. One day you will reach there. That is my advice, thank you. Thank you so much for that sharing, Herbert. You are. All right. Let me show you now how to write a letter. It's already 10.55, time goes really fast when we're collaborating and I would love to hear so much more, um, but I have limited time today. So I would like to show you my next slide on how to draft a letter that would immediately catch attention of the legislators or the people in charge that you might want to ask help for. So number one is you have to state who you are and your relationship, what your connection is to the issue. You can say, hi, I'm Taj Jimenez. I am an, a childhood educator of five years already and I've been teaching in this center for this amount of time. You can say, I am a voter and I did vote for you in the past election. And I feel like you have the power to advocate for this issue. Then you tell them the issue. You tell them why you need to contact them. You tell, I need your help with. You have to state this specific phrase so that you can be direct and assertive with what you want. You're not going to waste their time. You're going to tell them already the issue. Why? You can tell them my school facility has, has very poor roofing already or has very unstable um, gates and we need you to fund the renovation of our facility as our school is publicly funded by the government and we need your attention. So you can say, you can tell the issue. Then you have to share the data about this. In the past month, when the typhoons are coming, the, the rainwater goes inside and a few of our test papers got wet already. Some parents have been um, sharing their concern about the safety of their children inside the classroom. So these are data to help them understand the depths of the issue and that you know what you are asking for, that you have done your homework and that everyone um, has the urgency to fix this um, thing. And then you have to summarize what you have done so far to help. So you could say, I, um, I tried to fix the roofing, but with, with materials that are not, um, that are very cheap because we don't have the budget for it, we might not be able to create um, an environment for the children that is safe and very um, stable for them to do their schooling in, especially that the rain, rainy season is coming in. So there, you have to summarize what you have done so far to advocate for the cost that you're asking for. Then you have to add detail. You, you might want to say, these are the things or resources that we will need, and this is the cost that might take them. So for example, for, for these um, shillings, it might take, for example, $30 might be $300 and then you compute it and show it to them and then you include the call of action you can you can tell them um please consider supporting a bill that would not only help our center but also the other centers that might be experiencing the same thing that they can ask for reimbursement when they have when they suddenly need to fund um a renovation out from their own pockets. Because believe it or not, I know as educators, you have spent for your children, 
not just once, maybe twice or thrice, maybe even just as simple as, as um, school materials. Not all schools have funding to get um, ample school materials for the children. So sometimes the teachers, they actually buy it using their own money. So you can actually ask for your legislators to provide you reimbursement for this because you are a quality educator. You can provide education for the children that will be in the community, helping the community. So you add detail. These are the details that you should be putting in your letter and when you call action. And then the next step and the last step is to make it personal. You, you put relevant images to the email. So you can put images of the, of the children, maybe have them make posters. Dear governor, like that, please help us fix a roof like that. Then it would be a little bit personal for the letter and it would show how much everyone feels the urgency for this cause. It might not be posters. Maybe you can put audiovisual aspects, maybe interviews from the parents or from the children. Like, hey, what did you feel during the last day? Phone? How was your classroom? Were you able to save some of your stuff? Did you get flooded? And then maybe when your legislator sees videos, they might feel that connection. They might want to reach out to you like, hey, are you okay after this time? I mean, I saw your letter, I saw, I saw the videos, I saw the picture. How are you? Then they might want to connect with you. Then the last is, I wasn't able to write it here, but you have to add the power of community by deploying it at critical mass. The internet is just there. So you might want to set up a generator that could um, verify a lot of emails of legislators that are available in your community. So there is most definitely there is a predefined contact list for the legislators within your community. And this can be found online. I think it depends on the country. I feel on how transparent your country or your city is, you might find um, a way to connect with different um, legislators at the same time. So I feel like you have to add the power of community by doing that and by, as I said a while ago, using um, social media, posting it, asking your friends to repost it, share it in their stories. Um, you can even organize a party, a fundraising maybe, or um, a call to action. Maybe if it's really worse, you can protest. There's no, there's nothing wrong, I feel, in protesting. It's just a way of voicing out if the legislators aren't really responding to um, quiet um, advocacies. So if you feel like you really need to, to voice out your concern, I say you do it in a very calm, organized, and with a very clear mind. All right, so that's a wrap for tonight. I would really, really um, love to spend more time with you, but um, for tonight, I am a bit, a bit time constrained. So I will see you um, in the future, I hope. I hope. Okay, and great. That's oh, because. Um, what, 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 what do you plan to talk about the next time you come back? I feel like there is a lot of, um, I feel like there's a lot of um, questions about how to make children listen. I feel like it is a very hard um, thing to convince children who are very um, passionate and strong-minded. They have a lot of opinion already and it feels hard to, to convince them without invalidating their feelings, without pushing um, our opinions on them without making them feel that they don't have agency over what they need to do. So I feel like that should be what our next topic be, how to make our children listen without forcing things into them. Does that sound good? All right. I think that's a wrap. All right. No more time, everybody. The class will end now. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute your microphones. There, you can now unmute your microphones to say thank you and goodbye to Taj Jimenez. Until next time. Thank you, Taji. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.